Very well, then we can start. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our last session before the Christmas uh, break. This is a series of seminars that is run through the European Governance and Politics uh, uh, program. I will be chairing, my name is Daniele Caramani, for those who joined for the first time, and I will be chairing the session today. And today we have one of our uh, different types of sessions. It's a book presentations, but we have also other types of uh, sessions, including research seminars, book presentations, seminars of the EU working study uh, uh, group, conversations on the future of uh, Europe. And uh, from January, we will also have a series on the Europe in the, in the world. And today's session, as I mentioned, is a book presentation and more specifically a book and we see it here, a uh, uh, very impressive uh, volume on uh, the health politics in Europe. It's a multi-author book published by o OUP, excuse me, <clears throat> and uh, which has been coordinated by Ellen Immergut of the SPS department and the Tamara Popich, Queen Mary University in London, uh, but currently on the Max Weber program here at the EUI. And we are very fortunate that both coordinators or editors of the book are present uh, today. I'm also very grateful for our two discussants, Federico Romero of the History Department and Martin Fink of the Robert Schumann uh, Center. Thank you very much, everyone, for being uh, here. In terms of formats, so the presenter will speak about 10 minutes each, and then the uh, discussant will have time to discuss the um, opening chapter of the, the book. And I guess you will also have 10 minutes each uh, if, that's, uh, if that's okay. Um, for those in the room, remember then when we then uh, move to Q&A, you have to switch on your uh, microphone so that the camera then uh, points at you. And for those on online, please raise your uh, hand and uh, we will try to alter alternate questions from the room and from those attending um, online. Thank you very much again for uh, being with us today and uh, the floor is yours, Ellen, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you on behalf of both of us for inviting us here to present our book and thank you to the discussants for taking the time to look at the first chapter and uh, make some comments on them. I'm very uh, interested to hear that. So uh, as you see, it's a very big book. We've looked at 35 countries, uh, health politics from 1989 to 2019, because this was a period of uh, transformation and disruption of health systems throughout Europe. Nevertheless, uh, they have quite uh, law, deep historical roots. And in the introduction to the book and also in my talk here, I will just very briefly focus on some lights, highlights of the historical development of European health systems. And then I will hand the floor to uh, Tamara who will focus on changes in since 1989 in Eastern Europe where uh, these state-centered health systems underwent much more severe transformation. Now, it is a um, tradition uh, uh, to, or in European uh, studies to apply a macro sociological historical approach mm -hmm. to understand uh, the development of states and party systems, for example, uh, based on authors such as Stein Rokan, Gianfranco Poggi, uh, also from the EUI, Peter Flora, and that's what I'm going to touch on today. I'm not sure, uh, got it, okay. Okay, good. So it's a little confusing because there are different uh, things to look at here, okay. So in very broad brushstrokes, I will focus on the periods of the state church conflict from the 16th to the 19th centuries. Uh, industrialization and the social question, World War I, and uh, it's great, the aftermath with its expansion of political social rights and the post-war settlement that followed the Second World War. 
Now, the uh, state church conflict had very important ramifications for the provision of health care in Europe. It uh, disrupted and changed uh, the medieval order. In Northern Europe and in England, where the state usurped church property, which included hospitals, uh, this started a, a pattern of state dominance of public hospitals, met strong medical monopoly and uh, systems of public health that were introduced very early on. By contrast, in Southern Europe, the Catholic Church fought for centuries against any state encroachment on health and social provision, uh, which meant a very weak role for the state and uh, much more development of public health care and public health provision actually in the periods of democratization in the 40s in Italy, but 60s and 70s for some other Southern European countries. In continental Europe, where we see a different pattern, we have confessionally mixed countries and there the churches held on to their rights and uh, prevented expansion of public control over the health center. And we see still a pattern of pluralistic hospital ownership, a weak role for the state in fighting infectious disease, and even weak medical licensing. So it's quite interesting in light of the anti-vax movements today that Switzerland and Germany, for example, had substantial periods with zero medical licensing. So uh, these also skepticism about school medicine or state control of medicine are quite deep in those countries. With the rise of industrialization and uh, labor movements, uh, we see the development of mutual funds, friendly societies that uh, carried first burial insurance, but also income uh, coverage so that if people uh, could not work that they would have some income uh, and later uh, provision of health services through these funds and uh, initial public um, programs having to these funds had an interest in controlling these funds. So the mutual policy of Napoleon III had the uh, specific intent of keeping an eye on these uh, labor associations and groups that were meeting in their friendly societies or sickness funds. And uh, there, uh, there was a um, policy of honorary membership. So an honorary member in France of a sickness fund would have 50,000 votes as compared to the normal members with one vote each. So there was, this was a way they paid much higher contributions, but they had much greater voting power. Uh, many countries here, I just listed some, you know, of the overview of some important sickness fund laws. The early laws provided for some government funding or subsidies to their funds, registration of the funds, some control over their uh, books and membership lists. Uh, but those were voluntary movements, not compulsory. At the end of the 19th century, we see further development with Bismarck's compulsory social insurance laws that provided for compulsory coverage, but not through the state, through voluntary associations, which then had compulsory membership for certain groups. After the First World War, these uh, health insurance programs expanded greatly. Some examples are the Lloyd George 1911 British and National Health Insurance Act, Acts in the Netherlands, the French social insurance law. And then after the second world war, we have a breakthrough to really universal health systems that have uh, in Europe taken two forms, the national health services. And here we see this historical pattern that these, uh, these are the state church countries here. And here are the Catholic countries here. These all have national health services Whereas in continental Europe, they, we have compulsory contributory insurance. And in Eastern Europe, although these countries came from a system of state-centered uh, government or in Yugoslavia, workers-controlled health systems, 
after the transition to uh, capitalism and democracy, they went another route. But this is what Tamara is going to uh, continue and tell us about. So thank you. How do I find my presentation here now? At the end of slideshow. I tried. Or over there at stop. You see that little see that little stop? Okay. Not close here. Could you just uh, what you showed us before where the presentations were saved? Sorry. Yeah. Stop sharing. Yeah. Are you so you have to stop sharing? Yes. Okay. okay. And then uh, uh, the PowerPoint presentation. How do I find it? Because it was supposed to be shared. And uh, I'll share share. screen. I just share. Okay, mm -hmm. and then I pick which one do I want. So this is mine. Okay, okay. good. Take some time, probably. Uh, I think that's the end of mine. Yes. Uh, it's OK, good. OK. There are always some technical issues, but uh, things are working in the end. So, um, so yeah, thank you everybody. Just to repeat a thank, uh, from, thank you from Ellen's side for this opportunity to present actually at the European uh, Governance and Policy Program. It's a special pleasure to me to uh, come back to the UI because I'm a former graduate and also a former Max Weber fellow. Uh, so uh, uh, just uh, a pleasure to present in such a uh, gorgeous environment of Sala Europa. So uh, what I'm gonna talk about is gonna be a zoom into the post-communist uh, countries. Uh, so I'm going to give you the post-communist perspective when it comes to health politics in Europe, uh, and um, I'm uh, going to talk about some of the main insights from our, uh, our handbook uh, and uh, also about some of my own research, uh, which will be uh, showcased in my forthcoming book, which is on uh, health politics uh, in post-communist context, uh, and the book is forthcoming next year with Paul Graham Macmillan. So, um, so in terms of the post-communist perspective, so uh, maybe also just to tell you a little bit of the background of why we actually ended up with having 18 countries from Eastern European covered uh, in this book. Uh, so uh, initially, Alan's idea was to kind of not really include that many of these countries here, but then uh, as I kind of joined on board with uh, work on the book and so on, we talked about actually why not kind of going further and trying really to, uh, to cover all these countries. Because the fact uh, is that uh, not so much was known. There was a kind of a black hole in terms of knowledge about some of the regions, in particular, for example, uh, Southern Eastern Europe. Uh, but also there was a kind of strong also theoretical rationale because these are the countries that are uh, the European countries with the most recent experience of state and regime transformation. So the idea was to kind of, uh, through this analysis, allow us to, to gain some in insights in terms of how uh, these political developments have influenced the institutional framework uh, of the health system. So uh, we covered uh, the countries that you selected here, divided in uh, three different regions. Um, and then in terms of, of my own book, uh, it's a kind of in-depth uh, then further analysis uh, into the issues of politics uh, of health policy uh, in post-communist context with focus on uh, three countries from uh, Central Eastern Europe, uh, Slovenia, Czech Republic and Poland. Uh, and uh, the book uh, is based on this uh, argument on the role of ideas. That's why, as you can see it here in the title, it has the politics of policy learning, uh, which uh, is the basis of the, of the core of the theory framework. And just to tell you a little bit about it. Um, so in terms of the role of ideas, uh, so uh, this argument on the role of ideas in the context of post-communist uh, policy making goes uh, against the several um, uh, views in terms of welfare state restructuring uh, in the region. Uh, and one of these uh, views is actually that what happened in these countries after 89, after the fall of communism, is that there was a kind of a sort of a policy vacuum. And that this policy vacuum, a lack of uh, kind of policy dynamics in the welfare state context, but also in particularly in health, 
uh, was exploited by international organizations such as World Bank or International Monetary Fund, and then basically using their standard uh, politics of conditionality, uh, influenced these countries and pushed them actually towards the uh, market and privatization direction uh, in terms of welfare state restructuring. Uh, in the book, I argued that this was not the case, uh, because what happened uh, is that there was no uh, policy vacuum. Actually, in uh, almost all of these countries, there was a very vibrant policy dynamic uh, that uh, followed actually the, the fall of the Soviet Union and the big uh, regime change, uh, and that these uh, market-oriented ideas uh, that were very lively in this early period and actually throughout the whole uh, three post-communist uh, transitions, as I show in my book, they emerged already under communism. So it actually, instead of kind of focusing on this 89, a big breakup, uh, I show in my book that they, these ideas were already there. And in some countries, they actually influenced some sorts of change already under communism. Uh, then in terms of post-communist period, um, I show in the book how a translation of these ideas into policies uh, from the side of of governments that were uh, pushing for them was conditioned on uh, par uh, party competition and also institutional framework in place, actually interaction between the, these two factors. Um, so this is really in the nutshell, so I'll be happy to talk about it in the discussion and the Q&A. Um, now, going back to a bigger picture, So what have been the main trends when it comes to the post-communist uh, health reforms? So one of the main trends, and this is something that Alan has already mentioned in her presentation, uh, was the shift from the Soviet so-called Semashko, a system of healthcare, which was, you can think of it as an extreme example of NHS a system in a sense that it was a command and control system in which state has exclusive role in healthcare to a social health insurance, but there were also some exceptions here, uh, such as the countries of uh, former Yugoslavia that actually had a social health insurance in place under communism. Uh, however, this was one of the main uh, tendencies. And this shift was very important because uh, what uh, it uh, led to was the, def the definition of the state in uh, terms of its role in the healthcare context, and also redefinition of the right to healthcare, which was not any more universal right, but it was linked to the contribution. So in whole uh, social health insurance, it was linked actually to the workers' contribution to, to the system. Um, another of the main trends was privatization of primary care. So in uh, almost all of the countries, uh, what happened is that the GP became private practitioners. So the primary care was uh, became uh, completely private. Um, then another one was uh, the shift from uh, free to conditional uh, access to healthcare services. Uh, so the examples were, for example, user fees uh, that were introduced. So uh, in order to access specific services, the patients had to pay user fees or to also buy coinsurance to cover these fees. So this was a shift from this uh, free and universal access to conditional modes of access to services. And uh, one of the last major trends, and it's actually a recent trend all across the region, is the transformation of public hospitals into joint stock companies. So um, uh, turning them into uh, uh, private entities. So these are some of the main trends. However, if we look a bit uh, closer into uh, the regions, across the region and what has been happening within the region. So uh, here, I just wanted to tell you something about the two of these uh, regions that we covered in the book. So Central Eastern Europe and uh, Southern Eastern Europe. So what have been the main tendencies in terms of uh, politics, uh, but also policy, policy making? So in Central Eastern Europe, the political competition was very strongly shaped by the success of social democratic and also in particular, the transformation of uh, communist successor parties. Uh, and uh, in this context, uh, political competition also uh, shaped to a significant uh, effect uh, the use of WITO coins, so institutional structures, uh, in terms of their potential to block the health reforms. Uh, and uh, also what is interesting, if uh, we look at these countries, that we find a relatively low salience of uh, health poli policy issues uh, and uh, variation in terms of corruption and perceptions of corruption. So, for example, the perception of corruption is uh, much higher in countries such as Hungary and Poland compared to Czech Republic or Slovenia. In terms of policy, uh, so there was uh, a more or less consensual shift uh, to uh, actually uh, some um, social health insurance system, but uh, there was a very strong conflict over the public-private uh, mix in these countries. Uh, then uh, some of the uh, issues that have been there in spite of the complete coverage 
uh, are uh, the public sector debt, uh, and indeed there is a tendency to try to solve these problems of, of underfunding and debt uh, through marketization, but this has also significantly varied throughout the region. So we have countries such as Hungary that returned to a tax finance system and blocked some very uh, significant reforms in terms of marketization, By Slovakia, uh, it's kind of a, a market trailblazers, we can say, in the region. Uh, again, uh, then we can see also this uh, specific regional, but also within regional uh, uh, tendencies and variation uh, when we look at Southern Eastern Europe. So here what we see is that government stability was a very important uh, factor uh, for the success of health reforms. Uh, and uh, what uh, is also important is that there was a role of political competition and veto points, uh, but we find in this region that actually uh, the, the influence of international organizations such as World Bank and WHO uh, has been in place in terms of uh, influencing the reforms uh, uh, in the health sector in these countries. Again, interestingly, low salience and the high level of corruptions uh, in, uh, in, in this region. Uh, at the same time, in terms of policy, so as I mentioned earlier, so these countries had different starting points. So countries of former Yugoslavia uh, had the social health insurance in place, while other countries uh, actually had the Semashko system under communism. Uh, so they differ from, from that point of view, but uh, it's also interesting that in terms of Post-communist reforms, uh, they show also very low uh, government capacity, in particular uh, in countries in terms of uh, capacity for regulation of private sector that has developed uh, uh, in an informal way within, within uh, health uh, sector. Um, then uh, again, also one of the characteristics is instability of financing, and this is linked to informal economy and the fact that it's a social health insurance or contributions uh, funded system and uh, other issues are also incomplete coverage so here we see the difference between the central eastern uh, and southern eastern europe uh, and then also um, uh, here we also see a variety, a variety of, of market reforms and uh, privatization uh, for example if you contrast countries such as croatia uh, and serbia that actually went for a very different path of privatization so uh, what kind of we can see here is the regional and also sub-regional variation even in countries that were historically belonging to the same um, states. Uh, so this is all from my side. I had another slide in terms of some potential reflections, uh, but I think I'll leave them for the discussion and then we can maybe pick up on some of those topics. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. We can move to uh, the part for the discussant. We have um, Federico Romero and Mart Martin Fink. Federico, you go first. Thank you. Well, I have to say that I'm no expert of health policies or politics. Uh, I'm no expert in health at all, except as a customer, of course, but that's um, very limited. But um, I, I must say that I'm, I'm not surprised as historians of the sort of relevance of historical paths and patterns. Um, we find them constantly in sort of historical studies on various aspects of welfare and the fact that uh, in, in health, uh, particularly given these, um, let's say, very you know, basic divide between uh, church and, and state uh, provisions, um, this is not surprising, but it's very, it's very relevant and very important that I think you frame you know, the whole uh, shape of the book starting from that point. I'm also not surprised, but I would like to stress this about the resilience of these big divides. Um, that they change shape, they change the compromises among themselves, but the, they remain there as relevant factors that have sort of shaped the, the play field to, to a large extent. And also because they provide institutions that once they're there, uh, are difficult to uh, transform or disarticulate, or it would be highly inefficient to do so as well. Um, uh, one, one thing though that struck me is that if I compare it to other areas of historical studies, particularly 20th century, but also sort of second half of the 19th century is that the medical profession, both in terms of research and practices, is one of the most highly transnationalized in many ways. So there is a lot of circulation of 
information, even training uh, from you know, the interwar period, and particularly the second post-war period. Um, and it, at the same time, the impression one gets, not from the single chapters, which I've not read, but from the introduction, is that elements of sort of mutual learning imitation doesn't really uh, affect the institutional shape or the politics of it, as one might expect by the fact that uh, some of the uh, knowledge and professions at the center of the health system are highly transnational. So there is a discrepancy there. Who learns what from whom, if they do at all? Um, Another point uh, that I find interesting, and uh, uh, it would be very sort of positive the book promotes uh, for further debates, is that you, you point at a certain point to the sort of at the European level, you know, a shared notion, even though vague notion of health uh, services provisions as a right. But then this right is rarely sort of formalized or legalized in detailed terms. You know, it's a right and no more than that. So an interesting aspect is how this then translate into the actual practices of these institutions. And that is, I mean, for instance, if we are related to the more recent period that we all know personally, how does you know, the right to health then translate in access to what type of health care, to what quality, what cost, what you know, technologies, et cetera. This is still deeply differentiated, not only by national system, but even a regional level, you at a certain point indicate you know, the differentiations, for instance, by regional uh, patchwork in the uh, allegedly national Italian health system, and presumably there are differentiation of that kind elsewhere. So one issue is how does this right, especially if we define it in, in contrast with the United States, how does this right then translate into actual provision of services uh, to what extent uh, this right is uh, sort of equally shared, to what extent it's then de facto corrupted, if not denied, by the you know, huge difference in, in financial resources available, in technologies available, in the number of doctors and nurses available, all things that we have also seen during the pandemic, the pandemic very clearly. So in a way, the sort of progress that European countries made towards you know, a sort of national health system uh, as a right, then uh, often enough hide a patchwork or that you know, makes this right a very, I wouldn't say dubious, but sort of debatable, debatable issue, even though, you know, it's clear. And, and I think even the pandemic, we've seen that the difference with the, for instance, the US is, is quite deep. Um, third problem. Uh, that maybe becomes more relevant when you discuss uh, the more the last 30 years or maybe the last 40 or 50 years in terms of the skyrocketing of technologies and cost in the health system. Uh, and that is less transparent when we look at uh, the European setting than again the US is what is the role of the health industry? of the uh, health professions in terms of lobbying, in terms of the, the pharmaceutical companies, et cetera. Uh, this is quite uh, evident and obvious in the United States debate and its politics. In the European one is always much more murky, less visible, less transparent, but one cannot assume that these sort of pressures and influences do not exist even though the health industry is a private you know, uh, outfit is less developed than in the US, still it is there and the medical profession is there. So in a way, how does the, the you know, long-term patterns that you study um, interact with the, the, the daily politics also at the level of society and the social groups and economic groups that are more concerned with health? And I wonder whether this maybe transpires more in the chapters about Eastern Europe after the, uh, 1989 or not, but that seems to me a big, a big issue on which, which we, we don't know much, frankly. And uh, the, the more we, we accumulate in terms of knowledge, obviously the, 
the better. Um, a point about the post-1989 transformations that you know, Tamara was summing up now, um, again, is the issue of how much is there mutual learning, looking at models, imitating models, importing models, or adapting them, and is there any EU role in it, at least in terms of circulation of information or setting of standards or not? So is there a sort of European space uh, that is relevant to these uh, transformations that you detail here country by country or by subgroups of countries? So is there um, you know, a European arena of uh, transfer of knowledge, imitation, institutional, um, dialogue, if you wish, between different uh, potential models or not. Um, and again, in this case, I think the issue of the relevance uh, of the health uh, sector interest uh, would be useful to bring in because exactly because it takes place sort of in a very opaque way rather than a more open one. Um, uh, uh, and finally, uh, I wonder whether, to what extent in the chapters you, you put these transformations that are you know, very much linked to 1989 and post-1989 transition and transformational politics to the uh, sort of ascent of both costs, technology, technology investment in, in, in medicine and in health system in general. So, what is the relationship between the specifics of health issues in the last 50 years, let's say, which accommodate the Western countries, Eastern countries, and the, uh, the post-1989 transition? Are there elements that are specific to this, you know, uh, ascent of sort of cost and possibilities, you know, given by technologies of health provision with the sort of debates that then drive the politics that you detail, for instance, in these slides, it seems to me an intersection that um, would be most interesting. And final point, I think, is the most obvious. I mean, uh, is the COVID experience setting up a new, uh, really transformative or even, you know, historical turning point in, in the provision of health services and the way in which all the issues that you discuss here, you know, the insurance versus national health system, et cetera, et cetera, are they being transformed? Are they in any way being more, becoming more homogeneous? Are they, again, looking at each other, learning at each other? Or do you see COVID as sort of reconfirming these different patterns in their, you know, sort of path dependency in a way that seems to me a big issue and from what we see on a daily basis it seems to me there are good evidence that goes both ways frank so i'll, I'll stop it there but i uh, enjoy the the introduction immensely and i think i'll have a look at the big book it's very big it's very massive <laughs> uh, because it seems to me you know that it it put the finger on a lot of intersected problems that are they do not pertain only to the health um, industry and health services, but to welfare in general, to you know, Europe, Europeanization or not, etc. Et so thank you very, very much. Thank you, Federico. Martin, if you like. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, Daniela, for the invitation and Alan and Tamara for giving me the chance to read your book. Um, I'm going to um, preface my comments with the same one that uh, Federico uh, made, namely, I'm not an expert on health politics, right? So that's important. Um, I guess I'm a comparativist uh, at heart, so that, that's uh, how I read the, um, the, um, yeah, the introduction. And I have to admit, I uh, could not resist uh, going a bit further in the book because um, yeah, it's just a fantastic book, so I, I used that opportunity. And I also read this as someone who in a somewhat previous academic life was a scholar of Europeanization, so the relation between European level developments and domestic level developments. Um, I, I come back to this uh, as well. Um, first of all, let me say that it's a fantastic book. It's really the kind of book that I like. Um, it's a big, so it includes a lot of information. It gives also, um, there are also annexes with a lot of information. 
Um, so it also gives people uh, like me who are interested in maybe exploring some of these comparative patterns, the opportunity to, uh, to play with the data. Um, and it provides a lot of ideas uh, for everyone here at the EY. You can uh, read the whole book online. So I, I encourage everyone to, to do that. Um, it's impressive, 46 chapters. I really um, appreciate the uh, large geographical scope, right? I think um, that's what we see. Um, we see increasingly back in the day, we saw sometimes chapters with books with um, a selection of, um, of uh, country chapters, but I think there's no reason why we would not just include all of these relevant countries and it just gives us a much richer and, um, and bigger picture. Um, uh, covering historical background and um, what's also nice in the chapter, so I, I could not resist reading briefly the chapter on the Netherlands and on Portugal cases that I know um that they are broadly speaking structured in the same way right they deal with idiosyncrasies from these uh, countries but um you try to cover all the similar elements in these chapters so that also of course facilitates comparison so um well congratulations it's a great uh, resource and um, i'm sure it will move the field uh, forward um now the you could say the the difficulty with um, a handbook right um is um that you that it provides a lot of information and it's so sometimes it's so rich that we yeah we we are curious for the big picture right and i think that's why it was a joy to read alan's chapter where you uh, try to bring some of these things together as well as some of the regional introductions by tamara for example right on on southern eastern europe uh, central eastern europe and my questions are mainly about the big picture i think also like federico I completely buy your argument that um, your institutionalist argument that um, yeah uh, the historical development of these systems uh, matter they are influenced by macro level factors uh, state church relations uh, timing of industrialization I don't have any quibbles with it I think that's overall a very convincing argument um, I suppose my big question is um, how does that still matter today Right, and not only in the way in which the uh, health care systems are structured, um, and I have some questions about the, um, could say the typologies, the variation, but also how that matters in terms of uh, performance and how the, this allows the systems to deal with contemporary uh, challenges. Um, I'm going to break this down into um, into two um, um, bunches of comments. So uh, one on typologies and one on trends, um, and. Um, let me start with uh, typology. So I really like uh, typologies, right? So that reflects just my particular interest, but other people may have different kinds of interest. Um, and it's actually, um, it's not so easy, right? Because it's quite complicated, I think, what we, uh, what we see. On the one hand, you are saying in the book, sort of, if we compare Europe to the US, then healthcare is generally you know, pretty well organized, right? So there are kind of two big picture messages here. On the one hand, you know, most people in Europe have some kind of healthcare coverage, right? So, uh, um, but at the same time, of course, there's a lot of variation, right? And, and you can make this variation along various dimensions. And my first question is about um, if you were to, um, and especially to Ellen, I suppose, um, in relation to your introduction, if you were to break down these healthcare systems, and it's already a bit reflected in the um, in the cover of your book, right? It's sort of a greenish, uh, red, or a yellow, orange. So, uh, if we break down healthcare systems um, and think about dimensionality, is it um, would you break this down essentially into two kinds of systems, or three, or four, right? And there are various arguments for this. If you think about how do they differ, right? So the the most the biggest uh, differentiation I think is between tax-based systems and insurance-based systems so you could make um, a two-dimensional uh, or one-dimensional um, uh, uh, distribution division of, of uh, systems um, but that would be I think misleading right because so um, um, actually there's uh, at least one I think uh, second Im important dimension which is um, out-of-pocket payments which um, are um, yeah, higher both in Southern Europe and in Eastern Europe, right? So if if I would um, if I read um, your chapter, but I don't think you say this so explicitly, so that's why I would like to hear your view on this. Um, the, the big distinction seems to me two-dimensional, right? Um, 
tax versus insurance and the, the degree low or high out of pocket payments. Um, and so that will be the first um, maybe question does, uh, do I read this correctly? Um, but um, the second uh, follow up question on this would be, um, yeah, do these structural variations actually matter? Right, so I, I, it's, I think you have a convincing argument of how these, how they have grown historically, but, but what does that matter? And I see that these kind of, and of course, when we talk about the politics of, of healthcare, I think that's very relevant, right? Because politics is about certain fights and that, that means that some people want something and other people want something else. So there must be people, some people are satisfied, others are not so. Um, and these systems also, um, so my, my sense is that it's not only uh, the historical contingency that matters, but that also influences where we are today, right? Um, but that the, um, the conclusion on um, the extent to which this uh, structural variation matters, um, yeah, was not fully clear to me yet, right? And if, I, I understand if you talk about, you know, um, if you have 46, a book with 46 chapters and it's not so, uh, it's not so straightforward and we have variation, not only big picture, West versus East and South, but also Samara said within Eastern and Southern Europe, we have already a lot of variation. And you mentioned also within countries, there is variation. Um, but the first question would be, if we're talking about how, how these systems uh, perform, um, what would be the performance benchmarks, right? And I see in your introduction and in the various chapters, some issues coming back, but you're not stating that as um, explicitly in terms of these are the main characteristics that we look at. Some things that I fished out would be um, levels of unmet health needs. Um, you could say, think about efficiency, right? So in the Netherlands, there's always a lot of talk about um, I think generally speaking, healthcare is well organized, but um, we also try to be uh, very efficient or maybe a bit cheap. And so if you, we compare to our German neighbors, right? then I think the level of government spending is much higher in Germany than in the Netherlands, even though they fit generally speaking in the same kind of uh, Bismarckian uh, system. Uh, and then you have a public salience and Tamara also mentioned uh, uh, public satisfaction and Tamara also mentioned the salience of the issue. Um, now, um, since this is a handbook, I, I, I wanted to know a bit, I would have liked, but I think this is also, this may give, um, I'm sure, yeah, this will be picked up and, and more work will be done. Uh, but um, where, what exactly does the literature say about the relation between structural organization of these systems and performance and the way in which these uh, systems deal with contemporary challenges, right? Is it the case that the, the, the text-based systems um, are better able or worse able to meet with these systems or or can we not say that at all and uh, to some extent you're also suggesting that Alan when you talk about the public private mix right so maybe an alternative argument would be well it's not at all about dimensionality it's just one dimension of public privateness and it all scales down to one dimension so that, that's not exactly uh, clear to me okay so these were the first bunch of questions on on uh, typologies then on trends um, um, well, a big trend is what uh, Tamara already mentioned, a sort of a paradigmatic shift from, uh, especially in Central and Eastern Europe and Southern Eastern Europe, uh, from the, um, yeah, the Samashko system to the, the insurance system, right? Um, so um, that, that's, that's one big trend. What I was especially interested in is something that Alan mentioned in the, the first page of your introduction uh, about how the, um, these systems need to cope with different stresses on health systems. And you mentioned three, uh, aging population, fiscal constraints and increasing migration. And I saw that also in all of your country chapters um, in the concluding sec sections of these chapters, um, you have a section on Europeanization, globalization, and migration. Um, I saw also in your preface that you're saying, well, the pandemic came along, but of course, you know, we rather than sort of uh, squeezing this in at the last moment, we prefer not to do this, but that would be, of course, another issue that, that we could discuss. And I wanted to pick out two of these things, so migration and Europeanization. Uh, in relation to the structural variation of the systems, right? So that's where it comes together. Um, now on migration, um, I'm not so sure actually what is the relevance of um, 
migration since uh, you mentioned this Alan in your in your chapter and it's also in these uh, titles of these uh, subsections but when I read these sections for example the Portuguese and the Dutch they don't say anything about migration um, and I, I also looked at your regional um, intros um, and I, I did not uh, become any wiser of this right so um, migration of course is relevant for a lot but um, so let me push you on this point so to what extent is migration relevant um, could be in two ways right so in the public discourse it could have a it's perceived sometimes as having a negative effect right so we bring in uh, people who uh, make claims on uh, on our welfare state um, well, I think that will be uh, so, so migration could have a negative or challenging effect on healthcare. Um, yeah, I think the more plausible argument would be a positive contribution, right? So migrants tend to be young, um, they work, generally speaking, uh, and um, so they should have a positive contribution, especially in the context of aging. Um, and, um, and yeah, they may also be healthcare workers where, and if there's a shortage, they uh, they make the system work, right? So um, now specifically maybe for Central and Eastern Europe, of course, migration has a different connotation because it's maybe less about immigration and more about emigration, right? So um, yeah, I think uh, migration, of course, compounds the aging effect, right? I'm not sure if it is, uh, if we can see it like that, Tamara, but uh, in that sense, of course, in would say in, in Central and Eastern Europe, migration would have a negative effect in the sense that it challenges the systems because people are leaving. Whereas um, I would say in the West, it should have a positive effect, at least in the way that the systems function. But just to push you on, on how that uh, works. So then the final point on, um, on Europeanization, um, I think it's interesting to discuss. Um, and that I think relates to that that could relate to what you mentioned in your introduction, Alan, on fiscal constraints. Um, but of course, Europeanization can have different kinds of effects, right? Um, and that's I think interesting to think about. Um, yeah, how these uh, systems in their different variation function. Um, and so, that at least, uh, yeah, for somebody like me, that's what I'm interested in. Um, now, uh, for example, Scott Greer, he has done work, so I still know his work from my old work on Europeanization, when I also looked a bit at healthcare, Europeanization of healthcare systems. So he says there may be uh, different phases. He mentions three in a recent article. Um, there are these network effects, right? Because um, healthcare, there's not such a very direct competence of the EU, but of course there is coordination between systems. Um, there may be a network effect. Um, I think the strongest direct effect is uh, pushed by the um, jurisprudence of the of the Court of Justice. So we, um, Karen Anderson mentions this, for example, in the in the Dutch chapter, right? Because there also some of these cases came from the Netherlands. Um, this basically means that um, systems have to adjust to the claims of mobile EU citizens. Um, well, Scott Greer in his chapter, he says that in his paper, he says that there is actually the effects of that on domestic systems is rather limited. I'm not sure what is your perception of this. Uh, again, I don't think that the couple of chapters, country reports that I read, they were very explicit about the extent to which Europeanization has an effect. Um, but if there is an effect, right, dealing with mobility, does this matter if for tax-based systems or insurance-based systems? Um, yeah, I would ex I would think that um, maybe tax based systems are. Well, yeah, I'm not exactly sure. The European system seems to be more geared towards the insurance based uh, system because your EU law says that if you go to another country, your insurance from your home state, as it were, should cover this. Right. So from that perspective, um, the continental system should be better geared towards dealing with this mobility pushed by Europeanization than maybe the more static uh, tax-based systems. Um, the, the biggest indirect effect of Europeanization, and this comes back in your chapter and also I think in other chapters, on um, is the um, greater fiscal constraints. Right, so the fact that um, the, you mentioned, I think, uh, Alan, the, you refer to um, uh, the cases of Italy and Portugal, where they were under pressure already of the Maastricht convergence criteria, um, then the uh, the recent fiscal crisis. Um, 
and uh, basically um, this pushes uh, systems to to be more efficient um, and also to increase um, yeah, user fees and out-of-pocket payment so it basically compounds this new public management trend that also uh, comes back in uh, various uh, chapters of the the book um, well, again then the final question on that is um, if that is the case right that urbanization manifests itself in these greater fiscal constraints um, yeah which of these systems then are better um, sort of equipped to deal with this, does it matter if you are a um, tax-based or an insurance-based system? And um, maybe some of these systems that um, already have um, a higher degree of out-of-pocket payment can incorporate uh, some of this marketization easier, or the downside maybe. And yeah, I think in some of the uh, the, the chapter, uh, your introductory chapters on Central and Eastern Europe, you you seem to suggest that, um, yeah, of course, it also may then lead to decreased dissatisfaction if there is too much pressure on the individual uh, uh, customer um, through, through, um, through marketization. So maybe there are certain limits. So um, yeah, that would be my, so the big question is this is structural variation in healthcare systems. Um, yeah, to what extent does it matter and how, how, how does that play out in terms of the politics um in terms of dealing with these um current pressure so well this is what uh, th those were the thoughts that came up when i read uh, your book uh, congratulations again and i look forward to some of your reflections thanks thank you martin also for your comments i think there is enough material for you to attempt the first uh, response so um Tamara, what I would suggest is I'm going to say a few things about the project as the big picture, mm -hmm. and then maybe we could alternate back and forth. I think it's very natural for you to talk about the institutional learning. You could do uh, something from Eastern Europe, and I might say something more of the older Western Europe, and then we could maybe do another turning on COVID, what's the relevance. So uh, let me uh, go back to the big original question that we had behind this project as a whole. Uh, it was called the paradox of healthcare futures. And the paradox is that in theory, the tax-based single payer system is cheaper, more efficient, and more egalitarian. So for the future challenges of Europe, it should be better adapted because we have fiscal problems, then cheaper is better more inclusive if you have a lot of migration people coming in with different statuses if the healthcare system doesn't care just anyone in the country gets treated that's more adapted to that and um of uh, democratization well forget that there are other stresses that go on the other so that it should be what we need we are worried about money in the future we're worried about aging we're worried about incorporating migrants the single payer you know ideal type uh, uh, system should be better. The paradox is that the impact of Europe Europeanization is the opposite. I think Martin is right. There's more of a pressure to go to the continental because it's more portable. Also, the budgetary success of the single payer requires you not to leave the country because if you can go fly to Belgium to get your operation that you had to wait for two years in the British National Health Service, it bankrupts it. Uh, Bulgaria is going bankrupt because everybody's leaving Bulgaria and getting their treatment elsewhere and then the bills are coming back to Bulgaria. So it, it does not work with Europeanization. And the other thing is democratization puts it under pressure because after the Second World War, people were happy to go to a doctor for free. That's not good enough anymore. People want to go to the doctor they want to, they want to get the treatment they want to, they have lots of opinions about what they should have and they like to go to one doctor and then another doctor. So all of this stuff is falling apart. So that was the basic idea was to look at all these systems and then test these hypotheses. But that's my second point is the tax-based versus insurance-based gives you a kind of first approximation of where we are in the world of healthcare systems. Then if I know what region I'm in, because most of these regional groups have quite similar histories. So you have a cluster that, you know, Italian, it, it, you know, you, you, it's just if you, I'm working with Italy, Spain, Portugal, there are a lot of similarities. It's just easier to know what's going on. But the real truth is that they're all different 
And the way we measure those difference is this public private mix, which has the four types of financing. So basically a, a mainly taxed financed health system with lots of out of pocket payment burden on individuals is different than one with very little burden on those people. So uh, that is so complex that this book is just the first step. We cannot really make any conclusions because it's too complicated. That's why we have the data set. And part of the slowness in getting going is my fault because uh, we did do coding of all these reforms and now we're checking it. But our project was also based on two very different methodologies. So the book is based on historical narrative just really finding out who did what, what happened when, where we can trace things like which you know, interest won and which lost and what were the party uh, conflicts about this and so forth. However, to really see which system is most efficient or which one produces more health inequality, which less health inequality, or which produces uh, more trust in government or more support for the welfare state. So that was one of our hypotheses. We wanted to do much more with migration, but we really couldn't uh, you know, handle. So some of our, our uh, you know, I'm happy you appreciated the similarities in the chapters because I had to crack the whip on every single author. I had so many people that said, I didn't follow your outline. So I was like, rewrite it. You, you have to have it. So a student writing a term paper finds the identical information in the two chapters they randomly pick from the book that they want to write their term paper on. So some things though, once I had the stable structure, we couldn't, you know, we did less. First of all, there hasn't been much impact of Europeanization. I think that's the big surprise. You know, so Scott is maybe finding some things, but, you know, he wrote his chapter without anything on Europe. Uh, so, uh, but in any case, so now the first methodology is this historical narrative, but the second one is really causal identification. So we want to use this data to see, okay, if I compare within a country, uh, you know, changes. So even if it hasn't changed its system entirely, if I've introduced privatization measures, so between two points in time, there's significant increase in privatization or significant increase in out-of-pocket payments, what happens then? So we've, uh, in our group, we've done several papers and articles, but now we can really get going because now we have the full rich uh, data set. But so uh, we've looked at, okay, if people switch from public health insurance to private insurance, do they become less solidaristic and less supportive of government uh, health insurance? Or actually uh, uh, Tamara and Simona Schneider have a paper looking at Eastern Europeans, how do their attitudes change? So they show that as the institutions of healthcare uh, become more similar, the attitudes are changing uh, as well. So that's exactly our aim now is to draw out these conclusions but I would say just one final word is that, for example, in the US debate, they really only look at countries where people speak English. And that's a big mistake because they look at Britain and they think they have the same kind of governmental institutions and healthcare structures that they could implement the same thing. So the progressive uh, policy line is we need single payer. You, the stuff doesn't work unless you have a whole host of other institutions that support it. So you need, uh, first of all, you don't have the same political system that wouldn't be able to be implemented in the United States. And you have more than 100 years of development of different health insurance in the United States, employer plans, all sort of stuff. You can't just take that away from people and get rid of it. It, it doesn't make any sense. So uh, I think that, that that would be one lesson is uh, probably in the United States, they should look at the Swiss system. That's the most similar. Stick to that because that you have some hope to achieve. Don't look, you know, or at the Dutch system, at the German system, some system where you also have uh, employer uh, provision and some private uh, insurance. And then one final thing, sorry, I keep saying, and just another thing, just another thing. The Public-private mix, I mean, it fits very well a left-right view of politics. So people on the left want more state, people on the right, they want more market. So it's very good for part, party politics. Uh, but both in terms of party politics and healthcare policies, that's been changing because after years of real fights about this, 
people are realizing that even in a very highly public system, a little private money is good. It increases capacity. If people don't earn money by doing something, they will do less work. It's very simple. So um, a little private money in the system is good. Too much is bad. So you have kind of one of these puffer fish or Goldilocks situations that it's the balance. If the public system is dominant, things don't get too out of control. But if the private for profit um, motivation gets the upper hand, then you lose health solidarity. Then there are people who are really in trouble. But I think the way Federico said it, in Europe, you don't have anyone who's really uh, going to die because they cannot pay for their health care. And uh, that's assured by a lot of different institutions. But I think once you have, uh, you know, so much of, um, let's say, public minded coverage, uh, the, uh, you know, you can kind of have faith that the European insurance companies are not doing the same tricks as in the US. They do a little tricks, but not to the, that, that high extent. So institutions, this is, I would say, um, a, um, you know, Schumpeterian or also a Montesquieu, the, the, the spirit of the institution is also important. It's not just the structural rules of the institutions, the whole culture around it does make a, a difference to how they work. So um, Tamara, do you wanna go ahead with the institutional learning maybe from Romero since that's the subtitle of your yeah. book? Okay, it's the title of my book. So, um, so exactly, that was also a particular question from, from Federico. So who, what, what is this learning? Who is learning what from whom? So what I mentioned in my presentation was a little bit about the origins of these ideas. And actually that's really something that came up from my research, kind of going to these countries doing field work and kind of finding some documents. And uh, what uh, I argue in the book is that it's a more of an endogenous process of learning. So not because there are many different interpretations of what learning means in context of, of public policy making. And, uh, and the one that I take is the, the one that looks at learning as a kind of more endogenous process. So I would say that there was not that much of a cross country learning, uh, but it was more a process that, as I, as I uh, say, started already under communism. So, and also in terms of learning, the experiences that they had in terms of health policy were important for kind of what they wanted to do in the post-communist period. So just an example. Uh, so the case of Slovenia, which actually was part of Yugoslavia, so had this uh, worker self-management. So they had experience with health system being independent from the state and run kind of by the local forces and trying to make it a bit competitive. And in case of Slovenia, they were very careful when they started with this marketization reform. So they had a very controlled privatization and kind of had kind of picking more from the menus of choices in terms of going for the market options while in countries such as Czech Republic of Poland that were kind of more Soviet and state kind of close to, to real socialism until 89, until October uh, 89, there we see much more enthusiasm for this market option. So that would be one dimension of learning. But then also in the post-communist period, uh, in terms of endogenous learning, it was more kind of, of a trial and error process. Uh, for example, some of the markets they went for were really extreme cases of uh, market reform, such as, for example, open competition between insurance funds, paying doctors with fee for services, and that the insurance, the main insurance fund rent out of, uh, of all the budget after six months of 1993 in the Czech Republic, for example. So it was really the cases of market failure. So they went for kind of full menu options, and then they kind of, uh, and it was actually the, the, the very neoliberal, the, the uh, Václav Klaus, the um, uh, Minister of Finance, and also the Prime Minister of Czech Republic, they were the ones that regulated them. So it was kind of the same ones that went for this option. So what I, what I really see there taking place is this process of endogenous learning. And that could also link maybe to just provide some answers. So what, what were the elements that were important there in terms of this push for marketization? Maybe to touch upon the issue of rights. I think it's an interesting question because indeed in all of these countries, it's, there is a constitutional right. And I immediately thought about also the waiting time guarantees and your research on that. So in, in some European countries, it's a way to kind of you know, to confirm these rights by providing uh, waiting time guarantees. In the Eastern European context, that has not been the case, but one very interesting thing, and here we also come to the institutional uh, role is that in some of these countries, um, 
Uh, again, to come back to Czech Republic, there was this case of introduction of user fees. I had a, a picture of the article from New York Times. I didn't explain you, sorry, in one of my slides. So they were actually saying $1.85 from American perspective. It's like peanuts, it's nothing, but it was a really controversial issue there. But these fees were abolished and exactly because the opposition was going with a um, to the constitutional court and saying this is against the right to free healthcare. So we can see one example in terms of how these just kind of legally formal rights actually do are put in practice and change the direction of the reform. Uh, in terms of how much this learning process was influenced uh, by Europeanization, so both of you raised this. Uh, that's an argument that is very often I, I hear in terms of my research. So what about the EU? Um, I would say that it was a very limited influence that has a potential of becoming more important and it's kind of more of a patchwork and exactly what was mentioned uh, by, by you, Martin, in terms of, for example, European Court of Justice. But what differs there is the way it influences and in which EU dimensions are relevant there. So you mentioned the work of Scott Greer. So, uh, and there it's kind of more the issues of cross-border care, right, kind of patients moving on. And in Central Eastern Europe, uh, uh, it's actually the strongest in the countries that have went the furthest. So just to give two examples, Slovakia and Slovenia both have uh, insurance companies that offer private health insurance. Uh, and there has been a big debate also on uh, what these uh, insurance companies are doing with their profit. Uh, and some of these companies, when uh, some more, for example, left-oriented governments have put a ban on profit, have went actually to European Court of Justice, say this is against the EU competition rules and so on. So we could see some tendencies. Another, another one, but, I would say not really influential for the direction of reforms. Uh, it's also the, the movement of labor. So once this country joined the EU, the doctors had a kind of exit uh, because they could just go for like the trend of Polish doctors going to UK. They had an option of exit, but in terms of health profession influencing the, the course of reforms, I mean, it was that at that time they could say to the government, okay, we are leaving because they, it was not only a voice, but also the exit option. But I would say that that hasn't really influenced that much the government policy because in terms of, of doctors, and that has been one of the arguments very often also in the health context that medical professional is the one shaping the reforms. But what I could see in the case of Eastern Europe, that doctors and professional associations never came up with a kind of comprehensive program for the reform. It was more about their working conditions and which are of course relevant because then if countries simply have more doctors put more pressure on the system and so on. And I think this is something, I don't know if this is also a chance to move to the issue maybe of, uh, of uh, co contemporary challenges and COVID, something that has been also stressed in East European context. So this lack of doctors, because the Eastern European countries have been criticized actually for still having really big uh, infrastructure in a lot of hospitals before COVID. Now it seems it's, a, it's an advantage. But then another issue was, of course, they don't have technologies, they have beds, but they don't have other things that we need to cure patients. But the issue of doctors has been raised. But um, I don't know if you want to pick up or maybe also on the structural differences. That's something we talked about uh, in terms of uh, response. Yeah. I mean, I think what uh, we see with COVID is it's they, the systems have different uh, advantages and disadvantages. So uh, the uh, social health insurance, and especially with some private insurance mixed in, like in Germany, they have overcapacity. So for decades, people have complained in Germany too much capacity. It's over surplus provision of medicine. But that was good in the pandemic because they had lots of extra beds. So until now, but this we're in two years practically into the pandemic. Up until now, they were able to cope. Now the, the rates are going to, you know, up astronomically. Uh, a national health system is better at giving out vaccinations. So it wasn't so clear at the beginning, but actually, you know, Italy, Spain, Portugal, they have gotten out those shots more efficiently. In Germany, they were always against this. The system is very based on the office practitioner. And so it was an adjustment for everyone to get these big uh, vaccination centers and to get people to go. Then it was up and running, but they really speeded up their vaccination rates when they opened it to their strong point, the office practitioner. But right now the office practitioners are overwhelmed because nobody wanted to go to the uh, vaccination centers. So they started closing them and now they need all these boosters. And so it's too much. So the, the, picture is very murky. I don't think there's a straight line uh, relationship between one system and what happened. 
I actually put this into my uh, State of the Union message, I think, or State of the Union talk in 2018, but also a policy brief I wrote for the actually this program, European uh, Governance and Politics, what are the lessons of this North Face Welfare State Futures Program. And one key thing is just the um, crisis of care workers throughout Europe. And that was a crisis before COVID, but it has now become so much worse. And uh, in the older context, I was making this point in the context of um, demands for um, social capital, build, social investment, because every suggestion for more social investment involves a care worker. It's a social worker, a teacher, somebody training people, helping people get back into the labor market and also get back to health. And But the, the people are burnt out. The rewards for working are very bad. And most of the things that people propose to help them are not really what they want because they like self-determination more than they want more money. But the more that we rationalize all of these jobs, like you have to take care of these old people within six minutes and then rush to the next patient, they don't like the job anymore. And they took that job because they have some intrinsic motivation. So I don't know how they are going to fix that. And that's something that I think it requires a lot of work on the European level with uh, qualifications, training, but also kind of convergence, because I think to finance this in an appropriate way, you need to uh, find a solution to not having so much um, informal work or black work. So, uh, but that's really, uh, you know, not something I would say is, is really something I'm a big expert on because what we focus on here are more economic reforms. So who's paying what? What are you covered for? Uh, not the health infrastructure itself. And I think that uh, the professional learning going on today is more about, okay, what kind of uh, treatment packages. So that's one big area of improving health systems now is to say, what is, I forgot what they're called, like care pathways or bundles of things, you know, what's the appropriate care for somebody with diabetics? Uh, when you send them to the hospital, when you put a pump into their body and all the stuff like that. So that's again, not really what we are dealing with. We're looking more at, you know, does the government provide this stuff for you? And especially what's the impact on public opinion? How do, how do people uh, react to it? Now in the historical, uh, from a historical point of view, one thing that I always stress about Germany is that it was the first insurer. So this is just like, you know, Gershon Krohn, the advantages of backwardness. All of the other doctors associations looked at the German model and said, no, thank you. So in Switzerland, they all said, we do not want to be paid like these German doctors that the, they all wanted the patient to pay the doctor and then the patient gives their bill to the sickness insurance. In Germany, it was never like that. It was always that the sickness fund paid the doctor. And not only that, they had collective payment. So for all of the treatments in one period, a lump sum went from the sickness funds to the doctor's association, and then they split it up. So that had a natural cost control because if they gave more treatments, they just got less money per treatment because there was one lump sum that was passed over. Doctors all studied this and said, this is not what we want. So the medical associations and also in Germany, they started unionizing in response to uh, social insurance. But in other countries, they were quicker because they certainly took a good look at what was going on. So they were not able to block public health insurance completely, but most doctors associations were not so hot on that. And uh, what uh, that's the argument of my first book that the difference between countries is what veto opportunities did they have based on the system that they were in, where they could block things like in Switzerland with the referendum, they blocked uh, health insurance for a very long time, even though it was suggested, but in other places they could not do that. So I think there is learning, there are changes but basically once you have a, a highly, you know, like the French hospital system, it just, you know, was made to be a state-centered hospital system in the French revolution. And it has not really 
decisively changed from that point of view. They have private clinics, they've done a few other things, but once it's a government object, it's unusual, I guess maybe also there are some costs that would be inefficient to somehow privatize it all. Uh, you, you don't completely change it, but yet there are lots of little policy changes and that's what we now have tried to set up the infrastructure given how, how complicated it is to put all this stuff together uh, so that we can go. But I think what is a simplifying uh, uh, you know, variable that I think you can use is this public private mix because it tells you quite a lot and you can get that for every country for every year. There are some you know, measurement errors, but it's pretty good and that, that will tell you a lot. So it's not one variable, but it's a continuous variable. And But you can still group uh, countries based on, uh, let's say, is it predominantly tax financed or predominantly, but you can also measure changes over time. So we're just at the beginning. <laughs> we'll have to come back. Hey, thank you. I think we can now open the floor for Q&A. Um, I don't have hands. Uh, from those attending online. Uh, yes, please um, go ahead. Can... Um, a quick question to Tamara. Uh, you mentioned the learning aspect, right? And I was just wondering um, where these ideas of where the learning was coming from or, or how far back did you go in the communist countries to, to identify points when, when learning or, or changes towards more market-based, um, let's say, solutions in the healthcare industry or in the healthcare systems started to occur. So, so how does, how, and, and what kind of, what, which contexts were more conducive to this lear, to learning in the countries that you, that you looked at and which contexts were sort of suppressing or, or, uh, constitute hurdles to learning and how did then the revolution or the, the system change affect the learning curves of um, in these different countries? Thank you, Evelyn. Um, so in terms of how far uh, I went, so I did take a, a historical approach and uh, was looking kind of what would happen. So in the book, I focus on these three countries, uh, what happened in terms of their just historical developments. And so in all of them, it was after the second world war uh, that uh, they uh, basically introduced universal care and built a really significant infrastructure uh, also after the world war, second world war destruction. And um, why I find this kind of theoretical framework of learning very useful to explain what happened because well, this was used by Peter Hall, but he also draws upon the work of authors such as Thomas Kuhn, because this idea of paradigm change comes from his uh, theory of scientific revolution. And what he's basically saying is what happens that there is one dominant paradigm, so it's a set of ideas. In the policy context, it would be ideas that actually guide the policy making. Uh, and then what happens is that kind of starts to erode in a way because there are anomalies in the system. And this kind of grows the origin of a new paradigm and new ideas. And this was kind of exactly what I could see there because so these systems uh, after the second world war with basically takeover of the communist party um, uh, developed the system that was working very, very well because it was also the, so it was a state command and control system. It comes a little bit to this issue of today's and uh, the national health service coping better with things such as COVID because it's a bacterial infectious disease. So kind of you just deal with it in a different way than you deal when you have a population that suffers from high blood pressure. You basically don't have to have a really large infrastructure and doctors continuously treating them. You can send them home with uh, medicines for high blood pressure. So what happened is that they were very successful in curing the populations and kind of eradicating diseases. For example, Czech Republic, the first one eradicated, uh, was it a smallpox? So they were really, they had really, they make really significant achievements. What happened uh, around at the time and already in the 60s and then became very visible in the 70s are the problems with the system. And this was, uh, uh, in my view, partly linked to just the profile of, of, of uh, diseases was changing. So the system that was really well functioning, responding to this kind of disease model 
kind of had issues now uh, adjusting. There is also the whole theory of epidemiological transition uh, and so on about the shift from disease patterns, which actually COVID destroys completely because we are back to kind of infectious diseases. But uh, what, uh, what happened there is that uh, then there were also the issues of underfunding uh, and the system was just not working as well. And then what happened is that there were exactly some ideas like analysis of what the problem suffers from also uh, corruption, lack of funding and, and other issues like lack of motivation for health professionals and so on. And what they were discussing is that they were saying that it's the problem, the system itself, it's not the people or so on. So it's basically this overly state dominated model. And this is what we have to change. So, and uh, it was very interesting to see kind of, because you said what were the concept contexts that were conducive to learning. I mean, in the case, for example, in Poland and Czech Republic, they stick closer to this real socialism until 89. What I could see is that there were documents, for example, in Czech Republic, it was a Charter 77, so anti-regime dissident group uh, that published a document of like 25 pages about what has to be changed in the system. And they explicitly were saying, we need something that is looking more toward market. And we think about these countries as being quite close and isolated. People could not really, you know, go on internet at that time or have moved to exchange experiences. There certainly was some international, and I think with health professionals, there was some international, they had colleagues that actually left exactly because they were dissidents, for example, to Germany. So they had some ideas maybe about what is happening in Germany. But uh, basically what, what was happening is that they were, they were saying we have to shift to a different system because this state command system is not working. Then what made it conducive for this learning? Uh, in the case of, of Yugoslavia, what happened in the 70s was basically this uh, a move away from the Soviet model with the Tito's regime introducing worker self-management. So it was kind of ideas came a bit more from the top, but I could also find documents particularly focused on health policies and issues in health and how this could be solved actually in going that direction. So there it was basically political regime kind of change that allowed for certain uh, reforms. And then I do argue in the book that this was very important because countries such as for Slovenia, also Croatia had this experience with kind of market-like elements already under communism and could know what are the possible failures and how markets can fail in health or just different dimensions and were more careful when it comes then to, to market options and marketizing to a full scope or a more controlled way uh, in the post-communist period. Thank you. And now I'm happy to have you. I'm supposed to be in the executive committee. Okay. So I can tell you that I'm happy to answer questions. And yeah. I'm happy to yeah. give people a chance, but I, I won't be unhappy if. So you don't have to. So. Now. I I think you have a question. Yes. Yeah, sorry, um, Ellen, for keeping you from this. Um, but, but just a general question, very, very macro question. I was a bit wondering. So you had all these major events: World War One, World War Two, um, nineteen eighty nine, and so on. And the way you treat them are kind of exogenous shocks, but they don't have this disruptive uh, force that we usually attached to it is that is that right or is that kind of a wrong reading of mine is that more an argument that you make of a of a gradual change endogenous gradual change i think tomorrow that was your um way of looking at things and what's the role of these you know critical juncture type of type of events um, is it really disruptive or why doesn't it have this disruptive force um that's something i was a bit struggling with so maybe you could elaborate on this Thank you. I mean, I would I would say it is disruptive, but because these different phases affect different aspects, it doesn't disrupt the old ones. So if you, uh, I mean, I it maybe is overly stylized, but you know, I like this grim model of the rise of the continental state, focusing on external and internal sovereignty. That fits very much with the idea that the state does not want the church running these health systems or providing medical treatment you want them out and you want to have a mono um what's it called monocratic uh state structure so you don't want this patchwork of 
universities doing some things and the church doing something other and then you have the medical corporations that's the this medieval overlapping system of competences so it fits into this mindset of specific rulers henry the eighth gustav vasa in sweden who say we want to get rid of this my goal is to make this monocratic state and uh these institutions are you know things that they can mold uh, De Gaulle had also these ideas. He has enough of the French parliament. And so at the birth of the Fifth Republic, first of all, they changed the political institutions, but that's when they changed the entire hospital system. So although there's a continuity that it remained public, um, the Reform du Bré was uh, set up to change the pattern of work within hospitals. And at the same time, they changed the um, social insurance uh, system to make it easier to control doctors' fees. And uh, before, always the problem had been to uh, the whatever the executive introduced, the Fourth Republic Parliament would uh, block. And uh, this time, uh, they use the right to introduce these reforms through decree. And then de Gaulle had stuffed the constitutional court. So a few things that went to the constitutional court, they passed. So that's how it happens. There's somebody who's trying to make regime change. And then they say, well, here are the, you know, when Steve Scotchpool was saying, well, de Gaulle didn't make the French Republic to change the health system. I was like, no, it's the other way around. Once you showed you made a new regime, you have to do something. And if somebody has a plan, what could we improve that fits your theory of what the new regime should look like as opposed to the old regime, then that's clay for you to mold into your vision of what is the proper relationship between state and society and the different uh, institutions of government. So I would say it's a series of shocks or movements. And I think for the, for the big pattern of history, these very, you know, it is basically regime changes, I would say, that we use to structure this uh, development. But within that, then, you know, each government comes up with different ideas about what they would like to do with the health system, but just just maybe to make, say, a trend that I didn't uh, come out with, I kind of was getting to it, is that what I would say we have had as a trend since the 1990s is we really have moved into an era where health politics is valence policies, that although the parties try and show that there's a social democratic view of the health system versus a conservative or Christian democratic versus of the system, they kind of get stuck because nobody's willing to say we get rid of the public health system or we get rid of all private practice. They agree too much. And so now the competition is about valence and that's specifically bringing up pharmaceuticals as now is a much more important issue and corruption in health is getting to be more and more big because that's a good issue that you can say is a valence Thing, let's fight uh, corruption in health. And that has not just been in Eastern Europe, but in Germany and Sweden, that's the, these things are becoming, you know, fake billing by doctors, all of that. Yeah. That's now coming up as being something that's really not, the question is not public versus private, but do we have, you know, clean behavior and providing patients with the treatment that they should be getting? Okay.